Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Gustav Krush, and I'll be talking a little bit about uh, MR physics, MR acquisition, and MR reconstruction. Um, this talk will be divided into three parts, more or less. Uh, in the first, we'll go through some of the MR physics, the magnetic fields involved in creating a signal for MR and the relaxations that go on, if you wanted to do relaxation that go on uh, during the MR experiments. Um, how we actually measure a signal, how we spatially encode the signal, and what type of uh, fields are, are going on inside the MR scan. And then finally, a little bit, uh, we're going to MR reconstruction, uh, how we reconstruct the data that we get from the MR scanner, and two standard ways of accelerating this uh, acquisition uh, with parallel imaging. We'll talk a little bit about sense and graph, which are two very uh, popular ways. Uh, so magnetic resonance imaging has a secret three components. Uh, the magnetic part, of course, will be exploiting some existing magnetization in the body. Um, we'll be using additional magnetic fields to create a resonant effect, and then gradient fields and uh, complex scanner uh, operations to image uh, and spatially resolve this magnetization. Um, we'll be relying on, on the property of spin that particles have, and uh, nuclei that have an odd number uh, of elements will have a small magnetic moment, which is proportional to this spin. Uh, and they will be related by the gyromagnetic ratio. The hydrogen has a quite a high uh, gyromagnetic ratio, and it's quite abundant in the human body in the form of water, uh, which makes it quite attractive to try to image. Uh, it reduces a sizable magnetic moment. By itself, it's not something we can measure, but in large uh, proportions, it can create a microscopic magnetic moment. And so it's, it's a commonly targeted um, nucleus for the purposes of imaging, although other ones can also be used with MR. If we just have a set of spins that are creating their own magnetic moments, uh, their likelihood of being oriented in any point in space is the same. And so if we just add them all up, uh, they will all cancel out and we'll not be able to measure any net magnetization. Um, However, in the presence of a magnetic field, they will lock into two possible energy states. One of them is a parallel, and the other one is anti-parallel. And as they lock into these states, they will begin processing at a frequency given by the so-called Larmor frequency. And from some geometrical considerations, we can determine what this uh, Larmor frequency is. Uh, and we can find that it's indeed proportional to this P0 field that we've applied. And the gyromagnetic ratio is, again, the constant of proportionality. Um, so whereas before we didn't have any magnetization, all of a sudden we have projected magnetization to two concrete states. The likelihood of a given spin being in one of these states is not exactly the same, and the ratio of spins are in the parallel denoted by this n upwards arrow to the anti-parallel, the n downwards arrow, is given by the Boltzmann distribution, which is an exponential distribution. Uh, the difference in energy there is proportional to the, to the magnetic field again, and also to the gyromagnetic ratio and the normalized Planck's constant. And these spins have almost a 50 to 50 percent chance of being in the up or down state. But it's not quite 50 percent. At regular, at normal values for these uh, constants, we have the Boltzmann constant K, the temperature, and at typical field strengths, it will turn out that only about five extra spins are pointing up for each million spins. So every other one uh, will have a 50 percent distribution, so they will all cancel out. And in the end, from all of these pins, only about five in a million will actually contribute to a very small measurable net magnetization. Um, so we'll be applying a very strong P0 field in the order of Tesla to produce a very small magnetic field in the order of microtesla. This M0 field is aligned with 
this large uh, magnetic field, which we cannot easily measure. But if we um, introduce another magnetic field into the problem, uh, then the evolution of magnetization will be given by this cross product. If this new field, this E1 field, is rotating at a lot more frequency, so it's circularly polarized, then this effect will happen. Um, so here we have in blue the magnetic field, total magnetic field that includes the static B1 along this longitudinal direction and the circularly polarized B1 field on the transverse. And if this field is rotating at a lot more frequency, which is the same frequency that the magnetization is, is uh, oscillating, um, and you can see the mechanization will spiral down into the transverse one. Uh, this is easier to see if we make a change of reference frame into this rotating frame, where it's very clear that the magnetic field flips the magnetization to the transverse. Um, these U1 fields are typically very short duration in the order of a few milliseconds. And for them to be effective, they need to be processing at the same frequency that the magnetization is, which is the Lattimore frequency. Uh, and since the Lattimore frequency at typical values is in the range of radio frequencies, these B1 fields are commonly referred as to as RF pulses, radio frequency pulses. Um, following this excitation onto the transverse plane, uh, the magnetization will naturally recover into its equilibrium state. Um, this is achieved by two different processes. One of them is T1 uh, recovery, where spins will give off some of this energy to its uh, lattice. Uh, and the other one is T2 decay, uh, where local changes in the magnetic field will cause spins, lot more frequency to change a little bit. And as the lot more frequency is a little bit faster or slower, they will accrue a little bit extra or less phase. And so they will start to dephase. Uh, which means that when you're summing up all these individual spins to create a magnetic moment, because they're not perfectly uh, in phase, uh, that signal will decrease. The T1 relaxation, like I said, uh, is modeled by uh, an exponential recovery. And in this case, the T1 uh, is the value that it takes for the magnetization to recover its longitudinal component to about two thirds. And T2 is, is a T2 decay, it's uh, an exponential decay, where the T2 value is the time it takes to go down to about a third of the initial magnetization. Um, these are interesting properties because they're specific to a given tissue. Uh, every different tissue will have different T1 and T2 uh, values, and these will be later on used to create different contrasts in a model. Something to keep in mind is that once we flip the magnetization into the transverse plane, it doesn't flip back. Uh, these are two independent processes that also happen on different time scales. So firstly, the T2 uh, decay happens very quickly. So we very quickly lose the signal in the transverse um, plane. And then in a quite slower scale of 10 times slower, we slowly recover a longitudinal signal. Um, all of the physics that we've discussed up to this point, they can, in terms of the interaction between uh, RF pulses and, and uh, the relaxation of the EMR signal, uh, they can be described by, by these set of equations, uh, the block equations. They're very useful uh, fundamental equations in EMR that can describe a lot of different um, effects like the excitation, of an RF pulse, or the signal that is produced after its excitation, where we will be undergoing T2 decay and T1 recovery, uh, and we'll be producing this free induction decay signal, which you can see uh, represented at the projection on the slide. So we now have a signal generated in the transverse plane. It decays by some constants. Um, and we'll be working on how we can measure the signal. Um, to measure it, we'll be relying on Faraday's law. So as the signal is changing, it will introduce a magnetic flux, which by the law uh, can induce a voltage in a nearby coil. Um, the change in flux will be proportional to how the, the magnetization evolves over time. 
and skipping a little bit of math, we can show that the signal that is this voltage that is introduced that we can measure in the coil um, is proportional again to the charge magnetic radio, uh, ratio to the uh, B0 field uh, and also to the M0. Uh, so this is the net magnetization we have at this point, which we can keep in mind that is also proportional to the B0 field. So there's a heavy dependence on the field, which is why there's always been a drive to go into higher fields in MR so we can get higher uh, signal. Uh, it also quickly depends on the T2 decay and it will be oscillating at a lot more frequency. Um, at this point, we have an equation that gives us some information about the signal we can measure in its induced voltage in a coil, uh, but we have very little spatial information. Um, and the solution to spatially resolved magnetization will be with yet more magnetic fields. But in this case, we'll use a linear, a linear gradient. If we consider a, a gradient varying along this direction Z, um, as we turn on a gradient, magnetic gradient in time, turn it on and off with different amplitudes, it will create a magnetic field uh, that is either higher or lower in different regions of space. And from the Larmor equation, uh, we know that this will cause spins to process at a different frequency. Uh, so we're attempting to encode some spatial information um, into the spin location. If we consider that we're imaging an object like this, very simple example, and we have an RF, RF excitation where we've um, flipped the magnetization into the transverse plane, it will process all the all the spins will ideally process with the same or more frequency. Uh, they're not there's no spatial information associated with any of these spins. Um, however, if we introduce a magnetic gradient field through this left right direction, all the spins will have a slightly different or more frequency. Therefore, be processing at a slightly different frequency, and they will also accrue a different phase. Um, and so you can already see that these spins now have a different uh, information depending on where they are spatially. Returning to the signal induced by the coil, if we now consider a, that we're turning on a, a magnetic gradient field, the phase that will be accrued by the spins will be given by the integral of this field, of this gradient field through time. And if you put this information back into the signal and we neglect T to decay and uh, ignore some of these constants that we had before, we can simplify the signal that we're inducing in the coil, this voltage, to be proportional to the magnetization weighted by this exponential term. And we can recognize this immediately as a Fourier transform. So the net magnetization is the proton density weighted also by T1 and T2 decays, which we've sort of ignored at this point for simplicity. The induced voltage is an MR signal that we get that is indeed the Fourier transform of this image. And this K vector, which is related to the integral of the gradients through time, is the Fourier basis that captures the spatial frequencies of the object. Uh, we can use gradients to select a single slice in a volume if we combine it with a RF pulse simultaneously. So from the Larmor equation, we know that the precession frequency will be given by the main field plus if we have a secondary uh, gradient. And if our RF field contains a range of frequencies, then from that modified Larmor frequency equation above, we can see that it will affect a range of uh, spatial positions. So if we have a, a P1 field associated with a given frequency bandwidth, uh, it will affect a given range of uh, along the uh, dimension Z here in this case. This will mean that every spin that is within this range, within this slice, will undergo the RF excitation and be projected into the transverse plane but spins that are outside this frequency range will not uh, will not be tilted and will continue to be uh, aligned along the longitudinal line. Uh, in practice, 
if we want to excite a perfect slice, this would be a, as a top hat function. And we'd need a, a sync pulse to achieve this. Uh, in practice, we have to settle for approximations of the sync pulse. Um, in this case, we have an animation of um, a B1 field being applied, an RF pulse, and the corresponding evolution of the transverse magnetization through time. Uh, you can see that at the end, after the field has been applied, we have approximately um, a rectangular slice, but there are some uh, elements excited outside of the slice. A common way to represent the effect of these magnetic fields and gradients is with the uh, pulse sequence diagrams. We have here an example of the combination of a slice selection gradient, GZ, and an RF pulse, which together allows us to excite just a slice of spins, and all the other spins are not excited. Uh, we'll go into more detail into a little bit of pulse sequence in a few slides. You can note that in this um, this block of RF pulse and slice selection also has a negative load on the gradient. This is because while we're applying this gradient and we're just using it so that we can manipulate the Larmor frequency in the slice, so it's the only spins affected by the RF pulse, we will also induce a phase. Um, and so to um, balance out the effect of uh, the phase that has been accrued while the grading was applied, we can have a negative lobe with the same area to cancel out the effect. So if we have at this point excited a slice, we still need to spatially resolve the information within the slice. We know that this M0, uh, our signal first of all is given by the frequency of Fourier transform. And our M0 uh, is an image, our SC is the, the Fourier transform of that image, what we call, uh, we, what we refer to as k-space. And the, a given position in k-space is related to the integral of the gradients uh, applied through time. So if we consider that we have already applied an RF pulse in a, grid, in a given uh, slice excitation to just excite the spins onto a 2D uh, slice, if we play out the so-called FE sense for frequency encoding and phase encoding on the bottom, then it means we'll be traveling to this point in k-space um, as k will accrue the integral of these gradients through time. If we then play out this frequency encoding gradient as we'll sample the MR signal, then we'll be measuring one line of k-space of information which, again, is the spatial frequencies associated with, with the object we're imaging. After we've done this, if we make a change on the frequency, on the phase encoding gradient, if we make it smaller, then once we run the sequence again, uh, with a smaller phase encoding gradient, uh, phase encoding gradient we'll go to a different line in k-space. Um, and once we read the frequency encoding, we'll read a different set of spatial frequencies that encode this object. The frequency and phase encoding can all be understood to be very similar uh, in this case with formalism. Uh, in practice, there is a few differences in which uh, frequency encoding um, is oversampled in the scanner, so we can very quickly acquire these, these informations where the phase encoding uh, is what will determine in practice the, the scan time, is the time we'll have to repeat scanning these lines. Um, there are other considerations uh, as well. Uh, frequency encoding uh, is also susceptible to chemical shift artifacts. And in practice, there's, there's some differences on, on how we formulate these things. But from the case-based formalism, they're all, we're all just using gradients to travel in the Fourier transform space of the image and sample all this information that we need to represent the image. We're not going to try and put all this information together. So to do, uh, to image, uh, uh, a 2D image in a more, we'll be using an RF pulse. And this RF pulse can have an arbitrary flip angle. Up to this point, we've only used examples with 90 degrees rotations, but this is, uh, 
every every foot angle is feasible. At the same time, we apply the RF pulse. We'll be applying a gradient along the slice direction to encode and excite only these slices. And then we'll use another set of gradients, frequency encoding and phase encoding gradients, to further resolve spatial information in this slice. So we have a brain image that we'd like to scan corresponding to something like that slice. And in the beginning, we'll apply some RF pulse, which tries to approximate a sync as best it can. And at the same time, we'll turn on and off the gradient uh, while the RF pulse uh, uh, is running. So we only excite a given slice. Spins in that slice will be projected onto the transverse. Uh, the remainder will not. And then for these spins, we'll run uh, a phase encoding and a frequency encoding gradient. We'll sample this induced voltage in the coil. And during this time, we'll have to remember, keep, we'll have, we're simplifying the T1 and T2 relaxation, but we have to keep in mind that the signal is continually relaxing back into its uh, equilibrium state. And once we've run all of these sets of gradients and rotating magnetic fields, we'll have only sampled uh, one line of information of case space. And we need to fill this entire matrix of information um, to fully characterize that object. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to repeat this experiment over and over again um, until we've measured all the spatial frequencies associated with this object. You can see that when we, when we start the, the acquisition, uh, the magnetization is in a transient state, so it's changing uh, behavior within after each RF excitation. Um, after a while uh, from, from construction, it will converge to a steady state, so after every RF excitation, we'll get the same behavior. Uh, we'll also introduce a couple of key parameters, the echo time being the time from the RF excitation to measuring of the signal and the repetition time, those are T and TR up there, um, which is the time between RF excitation pulses. One thing that we can do with MR is as we change these sequence parameters, these echo times, these uh, repetition times, and also the flip angle uh, of the RF pulse, we will have different behaviors of the magnetization. The magnetization will converge to different steady states, and that means different uh, signal intensities. Also keep in mind that here we're just representing a given signal with a, some T1 and T2 relaxation, and another signal with a different T1 and T2 relaxation will converge to another steady state with a different uh, signal intensity. So this is one of the key sources of contrast. Um, what this means in practice is that we can change by simply changing flip angles, uh, echo times, and repetition times. We can create a lot of different contrasts in MR uh, just by changing when we're applying some magnetic field and the timings at which we apply this. Um, another thing we can do is actually go um, for 3D MRI. So you can see instead of having a slice encoding. Uh, gradient. So, whereas before in red I had uh, some a gradient along the slice direction to do a, a slice excitation. If we remove this gradient, now our RF pulse will excite the entire volume. Uh, we can consider now the same encoding problem, uh, but in 3D, where we'll read a line uh, with the frequency encoding and have different phase encodings in two directions. So we can have phase encoding in Y and then a second phase encoding in Z. So if we repeat this entire uh, problem many, many times, we can create a 3D um, case space data set, which corresponds just to the 3D for your transform of the given image. Um, it's important to note that we can also achieve this with 2D multi slices, so by scanning multiple different slices. Uh, however, with 3D uh, imaging like this, you can go for higher SNRs, um, and also you can achieve slightly uh, higher resolutions along the, the slice encoding uh, direction. 
So at this point, we established a little bit of how MR is acquired, and now we'll be moving on into the reconstruction side of things, so that we can use a scanner with some RF pulses and some gradients to explore the K space that is the Fourier transform of the image. Um, and to do the reconstruction, Shikama, there's no surprise that we're just going to rely on, on a Fourier transform to go back to the, to the starting point. Um, a quick note on K-space, um, the central portions of K-space have information about the low frequencies of the object, and those are associated with contrast, whereas the high frequencies, so the edges of K-space, are associated with, well, the edges of the object and uh, information about small structures. Um, if we start from what well, we establish is the signal relationship between um, the magnetization and the signal that we measure, which is just a Fourier transform, the, this description right now assumes that the signal is continuous, uh, where in practice we'll actually have to sample discreetly the MR signal. So what we'll be looking for is we won't be taking the inverse Fourier transform of SK, but we're trying to find out what's the inverse Fourier transform of this discrete sample uh, SK, which will be given by the MR signal multiplied by some Dirac comp function, so uh, a set of Dirac delta peaks. We know the Fourier transform of this first half, which is just the, the proton density, the, the net magnetization that we've created. And the Fourier transform of that second half is also a set of Dirac delta peaks. And from the Fourier convolution theorem, we can put these two together. And we can find out that the reconstruction, the inverse Fourier transform of this discrete sample signal is indeed related to the actual M0 magnetization to the actual continuous magnetization, which is a good, good sign. It is weighted by a constant of delta K, which is not immediately a problem. This, yeah, this is not, this is not a, a big inconvenience. Uh, we do generate the magnetization, but what is a problem is this term, which will tell us that we will reconstruct the image Sure, but we'll also reconstruct an infinite set of replicas. And the spacing at which these replicas occur depends on the spacing between uh, the samples in K-space. So if the sampling in K-space is too sparse, then it will push these replicas together, potentially causing them to overlap. We can pull some of this information together to establish relationships in terms of sampling requirements in image space and in case space. So one of the requirements we will have is that the field of view must be at least as big as the inverse of the sampling in case space along that dimension. Otherwise, the replicas will overlap and we'll have aliasing. Uh, another one is in case space, we know that the, the the K-space uh, frequency, um, the high frequencies are associated with the edges. And so this will determine the effective resolution that we're imaging. Uh, so the maximum K-space that we read out to will determine the maximum resolution along the dimension. Combining all this information, we can establish a relationship between the number of samples, uh, the field of view and the resolution. Uh, and the number of samples in practice is proportional to the scan time. So you can see that in MR, there's a, a fundamental trade-off between the size of the field of view, the image resolution, and how long you need to scan to satisfy both those requirements. The MR reconstruction, uh, which we've seen is, is what we can achieve with a, with a form, we can write this as a linear inverse problem. Um, where here B will be our case space. E is an encoding matrix that contains information about the sampling, the case space sampling, but also the Fourier transform, of course. And X will be our image intensity, so the net magnetization that we're creating. Um, 
we can reconstruct this with an inverse Fourier transform. So the case-based data that we've measured, we can take an inverse Fourier transform to get an image uh, with some caveats. Um, it's important to note that this is not a well-posed problem. Um, first of all, we'll be truncating case space at some point, and this can create, create edge ringing artifacts. Um, also, in practice, we've, we've completely skipped the existence of noise, but uh, our measurements will be susceptible to, to noise. And the inverse Fourier transform, or the Fourier transform for the matter, um, of case space that has been affected by noise is susceptible to noise amplification. Uh, so this can lead to large noise amplification in the reconstructed image. And then finally, the key uh, limitation of, of this this of this Fourier transform, which is discrete, is that we need to establish this relationship between the field of view that we want to image and our fine. We need to sample the case space. Otherwise, we'll have replicas overlapping and we'll have aliasing. Um, one of the main problems in MR is typically speed. So, as you recall from before, we have to repeat this sequence many, 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 many times. Um, if we consider a 3D volume, then we'll repeat this n times the number of phase encodings along y times the number of phase encodings along z, and we'll repeat this with a frequency that's given by the, the repetition time. And for uh, some reasonable parameters that you'd use uh, in a clinical setting, this can easily take a minute. For higher resolutions, due to the pressure dimensionality, it gets exponentially slower. So we were looking at potentially very slow acquisitions. Um, one way of reducing the scan time would be, of course, to reduce the number of phase encodings. And we can reduce both either phase encoding along Y or Z. Those are interchangeable in, in the 3D case. So to understand full case space, one way would just to, to give up high frequency information. So if we only sample low frequencies, uh, the scan will be faster. Of course, in this case, we'll lose resolution in a lot of applications that's not a feasible solution because we need the resolution. Another way will be to undersample uniformly. So if we have an image and its corresponding case space, if we just take, we can just take one out of every two lines or one out of every four lines. And so the scan will be correspondingly twice as fast or four times as fast. Uh, but then of course you have to remember that we're, we'll be pushing replicas closer together. Uh, and the starting image is already pretty packed into this field of view. But what will happen is that these replicas will be pushed onto overlapping with each other. You can see that with the case of sampling every two lines, which we refer to this as an acceleration factor two, the acceleration factor given by the amount of information we need for the fully sampled um, the ratio to the to the number of the amount of data we're, we're using in the accelerated case. You can see that we get two replicas, and that each pixel will replicate half the field of view away. So the noise, so the nose here, is here on the edge of the image, and a replica of the nose will appear half the field of view away, close to the center. In the case with an acceleration factor of four. Uh, the replica, replicas will be pushed together and will replicate once every fourth of the field of view along the dimension that is being undersampled. You can see that along this dimension, we're still keeping all the samples. This would be the frequency encoding dimension, the superior and inferior. Um, and then the phase encoding dimension will get replicas. The form of these replicas now depends on how we undersample this case space. In the case of uniformly undersample, we'll get perfect replicas. It, with other types of undersampling, we'll get different forms of aliasing. So with random, or this is more like a variable density random uh, distribution, we'll get something similar to incoherent uh, artifacts. Uh, with radio, we'll get streaking artifacts and also uh, 
the ring a halo around the object. So in general, depending on how these uh, samples are taken and which samples are not taken, we'll get very different uh, aliasing effects. If we go back to the formulation of thinking about the reconstruction problem as a linear inverse problem, uh, then we're in a situation where we have less information, so we have less equations than variables. Uh, we're in a bad position. So we have an infinite number of solutions associated with this problem. The standard way to find the solution in this case will be by at least squares. Uh, but even then, there's no guarantee that uh, the least square solution will give us an, an image without aliasing. In fact, it will give us the alias image, simply because we do not have enough information to, to reconstruct the, full, the fully sampled, not aliased image. Um, and to, to do this, we'll need some extra information, some, some extra constraints or assumptions, um, which one of the commonly, the most commonly uh, used nowadays would be parallel imaging, which we'll be going through in the, in the last part of this talk. So if you recall the way we measure a signal, uh, is by putting a coil next to, 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 the, to the samples, next to the body effectively. And the induced voltage in this coil depends on the distance, the relative distance between the coil and the signal source, the signal source being water in the body. Um, so if we have a lot of coils spread around, then each one of these will measure the relaxation and the magnetization, the precession along the, the transverse plane, modulated by some function that depends on how close the coil is to that particular spin, which means that these coils have some spatial encoding already in them. Um, and ideally what we'd like to do is to maybe use the spatial encoding to complement the Fourier phase encoding that we're doing. So we can do less Fourier phase encoding and replace it with information, uh, spatial encoded information that these coils have. And in practice, we can use this information to either increase the SNR or more interestingly, to accelerate the acquisition. So if you consider an example where we might have four coils along this uh, spinal uh, scan. Each of these coils will locally illuminate the image of words. So each coil will be a complex function, approximately Gaussian, they tend to be very smooth. And the image that each coil sees uh, can be characterized as a pointwise multiplication of the actual image uh, multiplied by the coil. To reconstruct an image with optimal SNR, um, we can do that just by multiplying by the complex conjugate of the coil and normalizing by the coil uh, sensitivity profile of all the coils. And this, of course, requires some estimation of coil sensitivity maps. So we need to know uh, what these are to do this. But in general, we can do this, we can use this approach to increase the, the signal to noise ratio. A more interesting problem to solve would be to use coil information to somehow replace or regenerate these missing lines of K-space, such that we can undersample K-space, which will accelerate our scan, and from these aliased images, somehow put this information together to get a fully sampled image. Uh, and there's two uh, standard popular ways to, to achieve this. One of them is called SIMS that operates in image space, and another one is BRAPA, which is formulated in uh, case space. So for SIMS, uh, we'll be needing a couple of ingredients. One of them is the coil sensitivity maps, and in practice, we can estimate these from low resolution information. And the other one is the alias image for every coil. So for every coil, we'll have an undersampled image which has been aliased, and putting that information together with the coil sensitivity maps, SENSE will produce a fully sampled uh, non-aliased image. 
to go through the sense idea, we can consider this problem where we'll have a frame we're trying to image, and we'll have two coils, one at the front and one at the back. And of course, the coil at the front is more sensitive to uh, magnetization in the front, and the coil at the back, the same. If we undersample, let's say by a factor of two, then we'll create two replicas. And of course, each coil will see this aliasing effect slightly different because the coil at the front will weight magnetization at the front more heavily, and the coil at the back uh, will do the same for the magnetization at the back. But since we'll try to use complementary information from these coils to produce this ideal image at the top. So if we have um, an acceleration factor of two, then each pixel will alias half the field of view away. So those two red pixels connected, uh, they will alias onto the same spatial location for each one of these coils. Uh, and they're connected like this. We also know that each of these coil maps have two different sensitivity profiles that are associated with these two pixel locations. So the pixels that are produced, the pixel, the, the, the intensity values that are produced here in yellow uh, depend on the sensitivity coil maps and also on the ideal image. We can rephrase this as just the sum of two pixels. So the pixel location that we measure here for coil one um, is given as the value at that first pixel location n, and plus the value at uh, the pixel location m, half the field of view away. And both of these will be weighted by some respective coil sensitivities. So we have this image v1 measured by one of the coils. A different coil with here the coil sensitivities in, in the other side of the image uh, will still measure a pixel that is a linear combination of both of these pixels that are now modulated by a different function, giving a different uh, alias image and a different alias um, behavior. If we rename some of these objects, V1 and V2 being the pixels at different coils, C being the coil sensitivities, and M1 and M2 uh, being pixel locations, then we can uh, write this also as a linear inverse problem. And what we can see here is that this problem is no longer underdetermined. Uh, now we have two coils. This is the image is produced by two coils. These are the coil sensitivities we can, which we can estimate. These we know. And this is what we're trying to determine. So we have two equations for two coils. Uh, this is a problem we can solve uniquely. Um, and we can uh, achieve this with a more Penrose inversion. In this case, we'll also include here the noise correlation matrix, which accounts for noise variability between the coils. But to obtain the image M from the coil sensitivities um, and the alias uh, images is now uh, a one-step procedure. Uh, it's important to note that the number of coils will give us the number of equations that we have. And the acceleration factor will increase the number of aliasing that, that happens. So this needs to be less than the number of coils. Here we have an example um, of sense in action uh, where we can see that up to a factor of three, in practice, we can achieve good reconstructions. Uh, but for high acceleration factors, we'll start to see residual aliasing and noise amplification. We can study this effect, this SNR reduction. Um, and it's given by this equation where the SNR acts is the accelerated SNR, so the undersampled one, and it's proportional to the non accelerated one. But first, it depends on the number of samples. Uh, we know, of course, that the, the SNR will depend on the square root of the measurements. But interestingly, it will also depend on this factor, this G factor. Um, and this G factor is actually a spatial map that will characterize noise amplification in different regions of the image. So when we're doing a uh, sense reconstruction, the noise amplification will be different in different regions of the image. And this will depend on how we intersample the case space, how the coils are arranged, um, on the entire geometry of the problem. So it's, it's an interesting 
thing to keep in mind is that we can accelerate with sense and there are some limitations uh, which can be characterized very nicely by this G factor. The other way, very Sorry, common. Can I ask? Yes. The color sensitivity, is it uh, inherent to the coils or is it dependent also on the... It depends also on the loads that you put in right. and how you arrange them spatially. Okay. Uh, so this G factor will depend on the acceleration, so how many case-based lines you're missing, because the more case-based lines you're missing, the more aliasing you'll create. So here, this G factor corresponds to an aliasing, an undersampling factor of four along this dimension, and they're all um, aliased. The, depending on how, if the coils are very close, then that means they have a lot of redundant information, which means that this equation here, th these lines are not entirely linearly independent. So you have two equations, but you don't have two equations worth of information. So depending on the coil arrangement and how much redundant information they have, that also affects the G factor. You can have something like 30 coils, but only maybe six coils worth of linearly independent information, which that's what's gonna solve, solve the problem. So all, all of that information is characterized in the G factor. And you can see here where the G factor is higher, there's a lot more noise amplification, which is also where the coils, this is simultaneously the region in the image where the coils have the least sensitivity because they will be positioned around the head. So they will be very sensitive here and not very sensitive here in the middle. And also where you have the most aliasing. So the aliasing patterns where it's higher is where you have many, many pixels and uh, uh, overlapped, and there's an, a lot of unwrapping needed to do by these coils. It's where there's not clearly not enough coil information to unwrap them. Um, yeah. So an alternative way to do this is with Grappa. So Grappa tries to tackle this problem from the case-based perspective. And now we have the signal equation also with some coil information embedded in there. And the Phase encoding, we can see the phase encodings as uh, modulating the signal that we get by different spatial harmonics depending on how we increase the phase encodings. So a given line of case space can be written as the, the Fourier transform of the image and the coils, and non-acquired lines will be related to these acquired lines by these spatial harmonics. Um, and so what this is telling us is that there is a relation between a acquired case space and non-acquired case space uh, for, for the coils. Uh, if we can find out this relationship, we can potentially uh, regenerate the missing samples from the known samples that we have around them. Uh, one way to find out this relationship is if we uh, try to think of the, how, how the, the image, space, image space formulation and the case space formulation work. In image space, the coils are a point-wise multiplication of some sensitivity profile with an image. Um, and this means that by the, the Fourier convolution theorem, that this will be a convolution problem in case space. So if we have an image like this, which would be associated with a uh, delta Dirac peak in, in, in case space, a coil will, linear, will be a, a point-wise multiplication of this image and it will blur out um, information in case space locally. So this is a, a, an interpolation convolution type of problem. We can write the, the Grappa problem uh, like this, where we have some non-acquired case space samples, and we expect them to be a linear combination of acquired samples in, in, in their neighborhood. Uh, they're more commonly referred as target and source uh, points. So here we have our source points in blue, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have them for um, all of the coils. We can pull up this, all of this information together if we know this uh, interpolation kernel W to regenerate this, these, these missing um, target points. So the problem now becomes on how we estimate interpolation kernel because once we do, we just uh, interpolate all the missing values. Uh, in practice, we do this uh, from an auto-calibrated signal region. So we'll have a small region, uh, typically in the center of case space, where we have high SNR uh, 
where we know both the target and the source uh, points. And so if we know both the target and the source points, we can determine the interpolation kernel. And once we terminate the interpolation kernel, we can just regenerate all the missing samples. So putting this all together, the Grapper framework is quite simply to first acquire, take some low resolution um, data where we know both the target and the source points. So we can determine uh, an interpolation kernel to regenerate the missing ones. Uh, then we can take an, a reduced, uh, under sampled, uh, sorry, uh, case based data set, uh, apply the uh, convolution kernel, which will then produce fully sampled case based for all of these coils. We can take the Fourier transform for each one of these coils and then combine them with the Lutzen squares, and we have our uh, fully sampled image without any aliasing. Um, a couple of things to take into account um, with Grappa. You can estimate these kernels from the data itself, which is uh, an interesting approach, quite robust. However, uh, the kernel geometry depends on the case-based sampling. So if the case-based sampling pattern changes, this kernel also changes, which can sometimes be inconvenient. Uh, in terms of performance, we'll get similar performances to iterative sense where it works uh, generally well for two or three times accelerated, uh, but beyond that, we'll start to, to see reduced residual aliasing uh, and noise amplification. So in summary, um, we've covered a little bit of MR physics and how we use a B0 magnetic field to generate a signal in MR. Um, this is modeled by the Lamour equation how then a rotating field is used to project that information into the transverse plane, um, and how that information also relaxes via T1 and T2 relaxation. And this is modeled by the very important block equations. And then finally, how we use a set of uh, linearly varying gradient magnetic fields to spatially encode the location of each spin. Um, we also touch a little bit on the reconstruction, uh, how we use a Fourier transform to reconstruct the images, and there are some constraints to take into account, especially relationship between the field of view and the sampling in case space and the scanning time. Uh, and when we try to accelerate uh, the scan time, we can do this by end of sampling case space. And the most common way to do this uh, clinically used daily is with parallel imaging uh, using Sense and Grappa. Uh, I'd like to thank people who have helped me put up these slides, and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to speak up. Yes. Going back to the slides, the sensitivity, so, yeah. so uh, it is the so I guess if you for your hands-on construction in the environment you're giving us, do, do you provide the, the, the yes. sensitivities or, or when the scanner acquires the data, it acquires two sets of data? But yes, and commonly, then, you're absolutely right. Commonly, one way to do this is to, before you acquire your undersampled uh, case space, your actual acquisition, you can do a small calibration scan, acquire a low-resolution set of images, and from these low-resolution images, um, I'm not explaining you how to do that, but from these low uh, resolution images, you can estimate these these cost sensitivities. So you can do this one once in the beginning of your scanning session, and then you acquire all these different types of images with a lot of different accelerations and different contrasts, and always use these coil sensitivities to reconstruct the fully sampled images. So yeah, it's one calibration scan that you do before um, the acquisition. Yeah. Yes. Does that mean then that you do not need to know the exact geometry of the coils? Just you can it. estimate it. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, exactly. You can estimate it from an MR scan. So you can use the, the MR system to know the exact geometry. You image, in a way, the coil geometry, which is represented in these sensitivities. Yeah, exactly. Because that will also change. Uh, I mean, uh, with the patient size and the patient location and how the coils are placed, you can have. Head coils, cardiac coils, coils for every part of the body. So it's all inferred from the from the imaging, the same type of imaging that you do 
actual clinical protocols. Yeah. Yes. Regarding the G factor. Yeah. This um, does depend also on the undersampling factor that you use. Exactly. Or also the arrangement of the coil. Yes. So, um, question is: uh, Do you know for for different case-based undersampling patterns, we have exact a G factor that you can take to account to reconstruct in order to get rid of those artifacts or noise amplification? You can't exactly. Um get rid of them but you know you will know how much you can trust the reconstruction in each pixel location so it will give you information about how accurate the the the, the pixel location the, the reconstructed is in each pixel uh, but this is a measure of the noise amplification you don't actually know what the error will be uh, you, you you can't immediately use it to magically get the the perfect image yeah but, but it's already important information in studying the, the noise behavior of the problem. So you can detect the problem if there is a problem. If there's something you should not trust, like in this reconstructed image, you know something's not right and you can characterize exactly what it is. And you can design, you also use the G, the G factor to design uh, sampling strategies with better performance. So that's something you can do, which is maybe not exactly what you asked, but that's something you can do. Uh, and there's a lot of study on, for instance, sampling patterns and how we showed how some, some different sampling patterns have different aliasing properties. Um, that will also lead to different G factors. And so the noise distribution can maybe be more uniform, which is better than in this case where it completely destroys the middle of the brain. So, yeah. Yes. Speak a little bit about compress sensing and how it relates to compress sensing. Oh, graph and sense, sorry. Well, related to, I mean, uh, how compressed sensing relates. Oh, okay. So, uh, compressed sensing will just make the. So, compressed sensing will just give regularization uh, term. Let me see. I'll just try to go back to one equation that will help us. This. Um, so, a lot of these equations in practice are formulated as optimization problems. Uh, when we have uh, this optimization problem, we can have really any uh, extra uh, regularization terms um, that will help us uh, converge to a solution that we expect to be the true solution. An interesting thing is that, okay, one of the things that we could enforce, and I'm not sure if we can see it here, is that we will expect um, an MR image uh, in compass sensing will, will enforce additional information, uh, namely will enforce some information about the image to be sparse in some domain. Uh, one of the domains where the image is typically sparse, that means it has a lot of zeros and only a few non-zero entries, will be in its gradient domain, the finite differences domain. This High frequency information is almost a finite difference. You can imagine if, if there is, I'm not showing because I'm not prepared for this, but if we have aliasing or a lot of aliasing artifacts in this image, then we'll have a lot of uh, non zero entries. However, if our image um, is without aliasing, then we will expect in this high frequency information to have only a few uh, non zero entries. Um, in general, we can try to make the aliasing look like noise. If we we can make the aliasing look like noise with certain uh, sampling patterns. For example, if we go for a radial sampling pattern, like in this no this case, uh, you can see that if we undersample like this, we'll get replicas. Um, there are some sampling patterns. This is not the best random because it should have a better uh, variable density. But in this radial, we can see that the artifacts, at least in the center, if we ignore these rings on the side, they're almost noise-like. And if we project this image into the finite differences domain and truncate these uh, artifacts uh, there, uh, they will look like noise, and so it will be a noise truncation. We can effectively recover 
the ideal image without aliasing and simply remove these artifacts. And in practice, they will be exploited. Here we have an L2 norm to enforce the so-called data consistency term. And this comes from the noise properties of the problem. And we can have an additional regularization term, which will be enforced with an, an, an L1 norm, um, because that, that will be, there will be a surrogate for an actual L0 norm would enforce the sparsity on a given domain. And in terms of sparsity, there are many sparse uh, domains you can go for. Wavelets and finite differences are very popular. Um, it's yet more extra information that we can input here to enable even higher understanding factors. So with parallel imaging, we can go for two or three. Uh, if we add more information, for example, in the, in the form of compress sensing, or some low rank constraints, uh, we can go for even high acceleration factor because we're adding more information to replace uh, the information that we're not sampling. Okay. So further questions? Please go on the microphone. 